Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Today we're going to discuss limits and controls, and we'll begin by reviewing the MIAC 1953 criticality accident, which took place at the MIAC Production Association in the Ural region of the Soviet Union. We've already discussed the MIAC facility when we reviewed its 1958 criticality accident, but to recap, MIAC was a plutonium production and recovery facility that was infamously the site of seven criticality accidents. The MIAC facility was actually an old milk plant prior to its use in the world of weapons fuel production, which means that the facility had a host of containers of different sizes and different shapes, many of which were geometrically unfavorable, which means that they could hold enough fissile solution to reach criticality. The 1953 accident took place in the plutonium staging area, where purified plutonium nitrate solution was stored before moving on for further processing. The staging area consisted of seven cylindrical stainless steel vessels, numbered 1 through 7 on this figure, which were located near the back wall of a concrete cell. After some time, the bottom row of vessels was added to expand the scale of operations in the staging areas. These additional vessels were placed in an enclosure that had a 20 centimeter thick cast iron plate in front of the vessels, a 12.5 centimeter thick cast iron plate above the vessels, and roughly 17.5 centimeters of cast iron between the vessels. These plates contained holes so that the operators could access hose connections on the tanks. These tanks were 40 meters in diameter and 32 centimeters in height, which means that they were fairly large. In fact, they were large enough to hold more than one critical mass of plutonium nitrate solution. Therefore, to prevent criticality concerns, the site imposed a limit of 500 grams of plutonium per tank. Neutrons that leaked from one tank could cause criticality concerns if they frequently leaked into and interacted with materials in other tanks. And so to prevent these cross-tank interactions, cadmium plates were installed between each of the top seven tanks. Additionally, tanks 2, 4, and 6 were required to remain empty to prevent any possible dangerous interactions between the tanks. Unfortunately, in practice, this limit was not maintained. At the time of the accident, tanks 1, 2, 3, and 4 all contained plutonium nitrate solution, while tanks 5, 6, and 7 were empty. It's likely that the operators, who had no criticality safety training, misunderstood the intent of this three empty tank rule and felt that it was more convenient to group the four usable tanks together in tanks one through four and to group the unusable tanks together in five, six, and seven. Furthermore, if we look at the contents of tanks one through four, we see that tanks one, three, and four already contained between 500 and 700 grams of plutonium, violating their 500 gram limit. The operators in this facility had tossed adherence to criticality safety limits out of the window before this accident even took place. On March 15, 1953, the MIAC workers received orders to prepare tanks 2 and 4 to receive more plutonium nitrate solution, and their plan involved transferring the solution in tanks 2 and 4 to tank 18 using the site's vacuum-driven hose system. Had things gone exactly as planned, and this transfer would have violated the plutonium mass limit for tank 18, so their official plan was already breaking the rules. And what the operators didn't know is that an additional 5 liters of solution, containing 224 grams of plutonium, had already been transferred to tank 18 at the start of their shift. This transfer was not recorded in the transfer logbook, so they didn't know that it had taken place. The two operators began the transfer with one operator stationed next to tanks 2 and 4 and another next to tank 18. Following the transfer, the operator next to tank 18 disconnected the hose and there is a violent eruption of gas and foam from tank 18. With his hands, the operator also felt that tank 18 was significantly above room temperature. The operators drained the contents of tank 18 back into tank 4 cooled and diluted the contents, and then drained it into tanks 12 and 22. The operators actually got very lucky that the solution didn't go critical again after they moved the contents of tank 18 back into tank 4. Fortunately for them, some of the tank 4 solution had backed up through the vacuum hose system into the vacuum pump. 
Otherwise, the system may very well have seen a repeated criticality. The accident released two times 10 to the 17th fissions, but the operators actually didn't realize a criticality accident had occurred because there were no radiation detectors in this area and because the accident caused no mechanical damage. It wasn't until two days later when the worker who was standing next to tank 18 fell ill that they realized that a criticality accident had occurred. This worker received 1,000 rad of dose and suffered from a severe case of acute radiation syndrome, but he actually survived the ARS. Because the tanks were located on the floor, much of this 1,000 rad dose was delivered directly to the operator's legs, which unfortunately had to be amputated. Nonetheless, the tank's location prevented the worker's GI tract and bone marrow from receiving a fatal dose, and this worker survived the accident, living for about another 35 years after it took place. So what factors led to this accident? Well, there are quite a few. First, the operators blatantly disregarded limits and controls. Some limits were completely ignored, such as the 500 gram of plutonium per tank limit, and some controls were completely missing. There was no control to prevent 500 grams of plutonium from entering a tank, or to prevent the operators from using tanks 2, 4, and 6. As I mentioned earlier, the operators during this accident had no criticality safety training, so they didn't understand why tanks 2, 4, and 6 were to be left empty. And lastly, one of the main causes of the accident was the facility's poor record keeping, which prevented workers from knowing that 5 liters of solution from tank 1 had already been transferred to tank 18. So with this accident in mind, today we're going to discuss limits and controls. We'll discuss how they're used in criticality safety to maintain safe conditions. We'll start by defining what limits and controls are. First, what's the difference between a limit and a control? A limit is a certain value that must be maintained. For example, speed limit signs might tell us that our speed must be maintained at or below 60 miles per hour. During the Mayak 1953 accident, the plutonium nitrate solution tanks had a 500 gram limit on the mass of plutonium that could be in any tank at any given time. Controls are the mechanisms by which limits are maintained. If the speed limit is 60 miles per hour, then the controls that maintain a car's speed can include speed limit signs, police enforcements, or the car's speedometer. We'll discuss how to control various parameters in fissile solutions and how to enforce certain safety limits, but first, let's review the three general classes of controls. These three classes of controls include passive, active, and administrative controls. Passive controls involve building your system so that it's not physically possible to exceed some limit. For example, Designing a car that cannot physically exceed 60 miles per hour will ensure that it always follows the speed limit. In criticality safety, geometrically favorable containers are a commonly used passive safety control mechanism. A geometrically favorable container is a container whose size is too small to fit enough material to reach criticality. The tanks from the Mayak 1953 accident were able to hold more than one critical mass of plutonium nitrate solution. And had they been designed to be geometrically favorable, then this accident would not have been possible. Active controls use some sort of sensor to detect a dangerous condition, and then they respond automatically to ensure that the system remains safe. Some examples of active controls could include a sensor that checks your car's speed and beeps if you're speeding. But really, active controls should automatically intervene instead of relying on you to respond to an annoying beep. So instead, Perhaps a better example of an active control is a sensor that automatically begins braking your car when it detects that you're approaching another car or some barrier at an unsafe speed. In criticality safety, an example of an active control could be a scale that weighs the amount of solution entering a tank and then responds to automatically close a valve and shut off the flow of solution if it detects that the tank is too full. Lastly, Administrative controls seek to maintain safe conditions by warning users or enforcing some standard. Examples of administrative controls might include speed limit signs, posted warnings, or an agency that monitors whether the limits are being obeyed, such as the highway patrol. So which one of these controls is the best, or are they all created equal? 
Well, passive control mechanisms are generally the ideal control mechanism because they always serve their intended purpose so long as the laws of physics do not change. If a one liter tank cannot possibly hold enough fissile solution to go critical, then there's no possible way for the system to go critical. If two tanks need to be right next to each other to possibly go critical, then adding a one meter spacer or barrier on top of and around these tanks would ensure that they can never be close enough to cause significant interaction and lead to a criticality concern. So passive controls are the most effective control mechanism, but unfortunately, they are also generally the most expensive mechanism since you might need to build spacers, modify storage racks, or make some other inconvenient modifications to your facility to make sure that potentially dangerous conditions are impossible. To take things to the extreme, we could eliminate the possibility of any criticality accidents in a facility by requiring that every single container in that facility is shrunk down to a 30 millimeter shot glass and one millimeter eyedroppers. But it would be impossibly inconvenient to do any kind of fissile solution operations in such a facility. So if the only thing that can throw a wrench into passive controls is a magic change to the laws of physics, then that means that nothing can go wrong. They're impervious and perfect, right? Well, passive controls can malfunction if they are designed incorrectly, if they are installed incorrectly, or if they degrade over time to the point where they no longer serve their intended purpose. Because of this, passive control mechanisms should always be monitored over time to ensure that they remain effective. Active controls rely on some sensor to detect a potentially dangerous condition, at which point some actuator activates and intervenes to reverse the dangerous condition. Examples of active controls could include a liquid level sensor that activates some pump to move a fissile solution into geometrically favorable containers, or a weight measuring load cell that activates to close off a supply line valve, or some radiation detector noting the presence of radioactive material in some place where it shouldn't be. However, for active controls to be effective, we must do several things. We must continuously verify that the sensors that detect the dangerous condition are accurate and calibrated properly. We must check that the actuator or the mechanism that intervenes to remove the dangerous condition always functions as intended. We must check that the sensors in the actuator are both installed and calibrated correctly and that they are properly maintained over time. Administrative controls rely on using signs, postings, training, or some enforcement program to maintain a limit. Administrative controls are the cheapest to implement, and it's very tempting to think that your facility is safe because you mandate a slew of administrative controls. But in reality, administrative controls are the least effective control mechanism precisely because they are only effective if they are followed. Unlike active and passive controls, they require human effort and intent to function properly. You may have noticed that several criticality accidents took place on the first day of work after a holiday, and it only takes one distracted, stressed out, overly busy, or hungover worker to ignore and violate an administrative control. Furthermore, it's often very difficult to detect if an administrative control has been or even is routinely being violated. Most people break the speed limit almost every single day, but we hardly notice it unless we get into an accident or we get a speeding ticket. Along this vein, violations to administrative controls might not be unlikely. So what should a facility do when they notice that an administrative control has been violated? Should they shut down the entire facility or should they sweep the violation under the rug because after all, it didn't result in an accident? We'll discuss these philosophical questions a little bit more later when we discuss safety culture, but the effectiveness of administrative controls relies almost entirely on a facility's workers having an appreciation for and understanding of safe working conditions. During the 1953 accident, the operators didn't mind that the contents of tanks 1, 3, and 4 exceeded their posted plutonium mass limits. In fact, they knew that their official pre-planned transfer of solution to tank 18 would violate this 500 gram mass limit. If workers in the facility think that administrative controls are a pointless nuisance or that routine safety violations are nothing to worry about, then it's only a matter of time until a criticality accident takes place. 
So when we design a criticality safety plan for a facility, which controls should we implement? Our first choice should always be passive controls because they require minimal human intervention. We just need enough human intervention to check that the controls are installed correctly and that they continue to function as intended. If we cannot use a passive control, then an active control is our next best bet because it requires only moderate human intervention. This intervention entails checking that the sensors and the actuators are installed and functioning properly. If an active control is not possible, then our last choice should be an administrative control, which relies completely on human intervention. Relying on human intervention is relying on people who are, well, human. We all forget things, misread things, and sometimes ignore things because we're overwhelmed with something else or just because it's convenient. Therefore, criticality safety controls should rely on human intervention as little as possible. So now that we've begun discussing limits and controls, what defines a safe working condition? And how far from supercritical does our system need to be? The ANSI ANS 8.1 standard defines a subcritical limit as the limiting value assigned to a controlled parameter that results in a subcritical system under specified conditions. The subcritical limit allows for uncertainties in the calculations and experimental data used in its derivation, but not for contingencies. This statement is fairly dense, but let's talk about what safety actually means. Let's say that we have two systems. First, a sphere of plutonium metal with an eigenvalue of 0.91, and second, an infinite array of natural uranium fuel rods with an eigenvalue of 0.98. Which system is more safe? Vote now on your phones. Surely, the k effective equals 0.91 case must be more safe because it's farther from going critical, right? Wrong. What would happen if that sphere of plutonium metal happened to be resting near the edge of a table and that table was sitting next to a bucket of neutron moderating water. This system would be extremely unsafe. A worker simply bumping into the table could easily knock the plutonium sphere into the bucket of water and cause a criticality accident. Meanwhile, the infinite array of natural uranium fuel rods is actually very safe despite how close to critical it is. Because the system is an infinite array, it's not possible to add more fuel to the system. And because the spacing between the fuel rods happens to exactly result in optimal moderation, adding or removing any moderator cannot possibly insert any reactivity. There's really no way to add any more reactivity to this natural uranium system, which means that there's no conceivable upset condition that could cause a supercritical excursion. Operations with natural enrichment uranium are actually very safe. In fact, it's safe enough for natural uranium to be used in university laboratories routinely with no criticality safety concerns. The Chicago Pile experiment was able to achieve criticality using natural enrichment uranium fuel, but it went to great lengths to do this, mostly by using a highly purified graphite moderator. So from the ANSI ANS standards, actual criticality safety control limits must account for various contingencies, you can't just model nominal conditions, and in fact, we must design around all credible upset conditions and ensure that none of these conditions will cause our system to exceed the subcritical limits. These limits will also usually include margins of safety, and when all is said and done, maintaining a safe configuration may require controlling a large number of parameters that affect the system's critical state. So what criticality-related parameters do we control for in nuclear criticality safety? We'll discuss this in much, much more detail in the next lecture, but if we recall lecture two, we'll remember that we need to protect against perturbations to the Boltzmann transport equation, which occur by changing the production, absorption, leakage, or moderation terms, the terms from the PALM acronym. But more specifically, when designing a criticality safety plan, we must control for the magic MERV physical parameters, where the terms in this magic MERV acronym include mass, absorption, geometry, interaction, composition or density, moderation, enrichment or assay, reflection, and volume. We'll discuss exactly what these controls entail in the following lecture.